בשם השם נעשה ונצליח. We have an amazing shul Torah, amazing group, thank you for coming. My story doesn't start with religion. My story doesn't start with the truth. I wasn't as fortunate as your rabbi over here. My story starts with Alma de Shikra. The world of lies. Now the world of lies is very interesting. Because the whole time you're in it, you think it's the truth. I was surrounded by people that were not willing to tell the truth like your Rav. But they liked money. I had a lot of it, which I'll tell you how I got it. And for many, many years, they came, they collected, and they said nothing. And it cost me a lot. So I came to the United States when I was 10 years old, which is about 26 years ago. I knew three letters of the alphabet because it was in a cereal box. But when you're 10 years old, you come to a new country, you learn a language pretty quickly. I liked studying, I liked books. And my parents, unfortunately, did not know that if you send your kid to public school, he automatically becomes a goy. Not because he wants to, but just because that's his surroundings. When you see a bunch of kids, you know, when you're a kid, you're intimidated by them, you look up to them, you think they're all cool, you want to be like them. So when you see a bunch of Italian kids and, you know, Spanish kids and black kids and all types of other Irish kids, with the crosses and the earrings and, uh, you know, everything else. So, oh, wow, I want to be like them, because you want to be, be liked. So even though I grew up in a house that kept some basic mitzvot, kept the Masoret, as soon as we landed in America, we became Goyim. Serious trouble ahead for the satellite radio business. Here with his instant analysis is Ron Rubin. He's an independent trader, president of Rubin Enterprises. And Ron, uh, we were hoping you'd come in because you had some interesting analysis on this whole Howard Stern versus Oprah situation. But let's just start first with Sirius. You own shares of Sirius, not XM. Uh, the stock's down 5% this morning. What do you think? It's a buying opportunity. The bottom line is, is that uh, these two companies have a huge opportunity. There are only two companies in an entire sector. Expanding your own office, which is operating a different business. I could get how you saved money doing that, but how did you get Ashton Kutcher for all within that $2 million? Oh, we, uh, the, two, the $2 million didn't work. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it didn't come close. Um, no. I started working as soon as we came to this country. My mm -hmm. father taught us that the value of money mm. and he told us that uh, hard work is you know is something that you need to know because mm -hmm. uh, it's something that you're gonna have to do eventually regardless mm -hmm. and if you want something you have to go get it so we I've worked everything and you know when I was a teenager I had newspaper routes and worked in flea markets and electronic stores and mm -hmm. shoe stores so working was something that I always already liked enjoyed and was passion. good at I've had a passion for it I already knew what I wanted I wanted money the only purpose for school, unless you have a specific profession you're going after, if you're going to be an architect, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to be an accountant, where you actually need a degree, otherwise it's a waste of time. The only purpose for school in general is to teach you how to think. Since I already knew what I wanted to do, I didn't want to be a lawyer, I didn't want to be a doctor, and I didn't want to be in school for 100 years. I was already used to money. 17 years old, making a lot of money, I go to school, everyone is just smoking uh, pot all day and going to clubs, and it was fun, but it was a waste of time. I ran into an old high school buddy, and he told me, listen, you should go into the car business. I said, okay, fine, let me go into the car business. So I go meet somebody in a car business, and I uh, have a meeting with the owner. I thought, wait, before I spend any time here, do you mind telling me how much does your top guy make? And the guy was taken back, he was like 50, 60 years old. He says, this little kid asking how much does top guy make? He says, oh, maybe like $150,000. Oh, I said, oh, okay, thank you, I'm not interested. Eh, big head, naive, call it what you want, ambitious. So then his friend told me, I think you're crazy, but if you want, you can get into the business I'm in, but you're nef definitely not gonna make the money that you're making now. I said, what do you do? He says, I'm a stockbroker. He says, the guys that work in my office, my bosses make a lot of money. They make real money, but it takes a while. I go into this office, like if anybody has ever watched the movie Boiler Room, a bunch of crooks steal money from people. 
That was the office that I went into. And I saw, I didn't know obviously about all the stealing and the stuff that they were doing. And I see everybody's young in their mid 20s, early 30s. There's Ferraris and Porsches and all types of brand new cars in their parking lot. Everyone has a brand new suit that costs at least $1,000. So I said, okay, no problem. Can I start tomorrow? I said, yeah, sure. Okay. So I started working. We had to start work early. We had to start work at 8 o'clock in the morning on the dot and leave at 8 o'clock at night with, I think, about a half hour break a day. Long schedule, tough schedule, but you can manage. So one day at 7.58 in the morning, I'm reading the Wall Street Journal because I'm starting to learn about this business. The, uh, my boss gets into the office very angry and he looks at me in the office and he says, what are you doing? Get on the phone. Now, I have a little bit of self-respect. I don't like when people yell at me. So him with his uh, Italian hothead, he says, relax, you relax, get out of here, you're fired, you're ho go home. I said, are you sure? I'm very calm, and collected, and I'm not understanding why he's so angry at 7.58 in the morning. He said, yeah, get out. So I said, okay, fine, I leave. A few days later, I find another job, another brokerage firm in the city. The guy there is very ambitious, very hungry, much smaller office, only a few people. Within a few months, I start training other people, and on the side, I'm spending as much time as I possibly can learning about this business. I worked for him for the next year and a half, two years. After two years, I realized that he's the only one that's actually making money. I'm only making, at best, maybe $1,200 a month. And he's buying Porsches and houses and jewelry for my family and everything in between. It's just unbelievable and I still could barely survive. So after a couple of years of doing this, I decide that it's time for me to leave. We get into a disagreement, I walk away, and I go back into the electronics business for a few more months. And then the firm next door, which was actually a big firm, uh, calls me and says, do you want to come back to the business? One of the guys there offers me a deal. And I start working somewhere around July of 2001. I start working and uh, within a few days I realize that my so-called partner is a very lazy person. I'm showing up to the office at 7 o'clock in the morning. He shows up somewhere around 10.30, 11. He leaves at 3.30 or 4. I leave at 8 or 9. A little bit of a different schedule. After a month of working, our deal was that he was supposed to pay me $2,200 a month just as a draw until I actually start making money from commissions from all these clients that I'm bringing in. After a month passes, I tell him, okay, I need my money. And he tells me, no, no, I hold the first check in case you screw me. What a nice guy. As you learn from the rest of the story, money makes people do strange things. If you ever want to get to know someone, put a lot of money in front of them and they'll, they'll mutate into what they really are. When someone doesn't have money, they're usually nice, unless they're very bitter. But when someone has a lot of money, suddenly gets rich quick, usually they become a little bit of a different person, the person they were when they didn't have money. In the beginning, it was very, very hard because I didn't have any money coming in and any money that would come in went directly to this wonderful boss of mine. After six months, I got my first break, started making some money, made $5,000 for the month. Next month, made about $7,000 for the month. The clients I was getting started sending me some referrals. I was getting more and more clients, building the business. Life was never the same. Next month, I made about $60,000. Next month, I made about $180,000. And from then, that point on, a bad month would be about seventy-five dollars to $100,000. By August of 2003, I became the number three producing broker in the entire country for that firm, which had about 5,000 brokers with an average career of about 20 years. I was only in it for a couple of years. I made my first million dollars, and then I decide it's time for me to go and start my own firm. I have money, I know what I'm doing, why not? Hired a bunch of people, I started my own company. So started hiring people, started building a business, and then it got to a point where a bad month was about 200, 250,000 was making a few million dollars every year, gave some money to people that needed it, donated some money, bought a Sefer Torah. Throughout all of this time, keeping barely any mitzvot, I think any mitzvah I kept was by luck. I believed in God, but in my own version of it, which is like most people in today's world. We believe that there's a creator because we need him when we're sick, when we're poor, when we're hungry, but the stuff that he said, I don't know that much about. I don't have that much time for it. I'm very busy, God. I need to work. I need to make money. People think that God has done everything, can do everything, created the heaven and the earth and everything in between. But when it comes to Panasa, oh, he's limited. I need to help him. That's why they work on Shabbat. That's why they work overtime. That's why they spend their life chasing money and not even giving Hashem 
the opportunity to show you what he can do. Hashem tells you one major thing. I will help you as much as you believe in me. If you believe in me 100%, then I will give you 100% of your panasa. Either way, everything he gives you. When I say he's going to give you 100% of your panasa, he's going to give you 100% of your panasa without working. Money will show up. How? I live like that and I have no idea. Avrechim that are in kolels live just like that for many years. Like my Rav in Yerushalayim has been living like that for his whole life. He still can't explain how he pays the bills and when he goes to the supermarket for Shabbat, he doesn't even look at the price and he buys everything in sight. Who's going to pay for it? That's Hashem's problem. I do what He wants. He says, if you make my will into your will, in Pirkei Avot, you make His will into your will, He'll make your will into His will. He says it. He says, okay, this is what I'm going to do. That's where I learned it from. It works. Hashem sent me to Wall Street to become a big success. I thought he sent me to become the next Warren Buffett or the next Bill Gates or the next something big. If I'm already making a few million dollars in my early 20s, watch out Bill Gates, by the time I'm 40, you're gonna work for me. Little by little, the firm grew. I started training people. My main focus, aside from investing my own money, investing clients' money and doing research, my main skill set was a salesman. I was the ultimate salesman. I could sell anything to anyone at any time for the highest price possible and they'll enjoy it more than they'll enjoy it if they bought it for sale. I taught people how to sell, I created my own system. One day, a bunch of my guys went to a ski trip and I was the only guy in the office. I, was gonna, I told them I'll show up at the ski trip but I actually have to work on like you people. I show up to the ski trip, I said us, there was no business today, right? And I show them, oh no, actually, uh, no, today I made $26,000, this guy called me. Money was plenty and now I started getting fame. I went on CNBC. Bloomberg, CNN, started writing articles. Baruch Hashem, everything was going fine. But Hashem didn't send me to the world to do that. He didn't send you to the world to make money. Everything is mine is what Hashem says. Everything is mine. If you want something, I'll give it to you. But if you don't use it right, I'll take it away. I'm only lending it to you. As I continued, I started making myself feel better by every time, every week, somebody religious would come to my office at least two or three times a week. I had an open door policy. Anyone that needs something could come to my office, whether it was someone that needed money for rent or someone that needed money for tzedaka, they'd come to the office. I would say on the average, it was two to three times per week. Somebody religious would come to my office. Sometimes they'll tell us about Parashat Shavua. Sometimes they'll convince someone to do tefillin. Sometimes they'll just come to collect money. But nonetheless, they came. Now, if we do the math, I had the office for about 15 years. But if we just use 10 years, and instead of using two or three times a week, we say once a week. Once a week, 52 times a year is 52 times, times 10 years, 520 times. Which means that someone had 520 opportunities to tell me I'm a goy, to tell me that my lifestyle is wrong, to tell me that if I don't keep Shabbat, nothing else that I do matters. According to the Shulchan Aruch in seven places, According to the Torah, Bechtav, the one we got from Mount Sinai, Parashat Kitisa is one of them and 11 other places. According to the Gemara, which is the foundation of the Oral Torah, according to practically every single major rabbi that's ever written in history about Shabbat, even including the ones in this generation, and according to even a simple book that I recently read by a rabbi, a very tzaddik rabbi from Jerusalem named Rav Zavichi, about this thick, about the blessing of Asher Yatzal. Asher Yatzal, simple blessing, the one that you say after you leave the bathroom. At some point, the issue of Shabbat comes up. And he says, of course, if someone that says Kaddish, and he doesn't keep Shabbat, no one says Eya Hashem The question is why? He says because he's a Goy. It's not considered Jewish according to Allah. And he gives you 50 sources. So when someone like me or someone like Rav Mizrahi that's been doing it for 22 years is telling you, listen, if you don't keep Shabbat, you have a serious problem with Hashem, they're not kidding. But if someone is going to write it in a, in a book that's called Asher Yatzar, we know that this is common language for the religious people who want to learn Torah. We need to keep Shabbat. I didn't keep Shabbat. On Shabbat, I would spend my time going to the casinos, playing Texas Hold'em, playing with the best players in the world, the biggest game there was, they would, when I would show up, they'd start a new game. Not really a good sign, by the way. But I was a good player because I had no fear, because I had lots of money. And I beat a lot of players, I played in tournaments, I won some. I didn't realize that I was stealing this whole time. Most Jews don't know that gambling is stealing. That's the problem. While my business was kosher, very kosher, 
did honest investments, honest fees, honest everything. My hobby was a big problem. Why is gambling stealing? Betting against, you know, you're thinking, okay, listen, I'm going to play Texas Hold'em with my buddy. He's my friend. The problem is that even if your friend has millions, millions and millions in the bank, but he loses even $100 to you, he doesn't really want to give it to you. He'll lend you the money if you need to borrow the money. He'll even give you a gift if he has millions and he's generous. But he'll never want to lose it to you, which means that when you win that $100, you're stealing it from him. And there's one problem with stealing versus every other avira, every other sin. Even if someone found a way to be a righteous person, if they have stealing in their hands, when they show up to the door of Gan Eden, they will not let you in. No thief has ever entered Gan Eden, no thief will ever enter Gan Eden. The person has to go back in the Gilgul and come back to, the, to this life, to this world, and pay back the neshama that he stole from. Second reason why gambling is not allowed is because gambling is done in a place that's usually full of immodesty. Chas v'shalom if you actually end up at a casino. Shem Echem, what's there? It's not only not modest, but it's a full Chilu Hashem, especially when the guy shows up with a keeper like I used to go. All the, all the fake Hasidish guys with a nice hat and the payas and the black and white sitting in the same table next to me. Same, same game. By the way, those people, if you ever see them, they're not real. If they're in a casino, they're just wearing a costume. Don't get taken back by anything. They just like to wear a costume. You wear a costume on Purim, they wear a costume all year round. The Mahmirim. A righteous person belongs in two places, or three. Either he's studying Torah, he's at work to provide for his family, or he's at home taking care of his family. Casino is not one of those places. So place people like that have a special place in Gehenno. Why? Because they're doing something much worse than stealing. They're making the worst possible sin in Judaism called Chilu Hashem. Someone like me, before I became religious, would justify myself because of them. I'm here, I'm not religious. I'm being me. What are you doing here? You're supposed to be this holy person. Chazal says that if gambling was allowed, the world would go and become Sodom and Gomorrah. So aside from the immodesty, which obviously goes against protecting your eyes, which creates a lot of sins, and aside from the Chilul Hashem, and aside from the stealing, you're putting yourself in a very, very big dilemma with Hashem. So you have to stay away from those places. Now what do you do if you've already gambled or you already stole? You want to go to Gan Eden, you want to, you want to do tshuva. Chazal already knew this. So what do they do? They implemented something from the Torah that all Jews are obligated to do. You have to give tzedakah. It's not a hobby. There's two forms of tzedakah. There's tzedakah that every person has to give, at least a puta, something minimal. Obviously, if you have more, you should give more. And then there's maser. Maser is 10% of your net income after paying the main bills that you have. So for example, if somebody makes $1,000, they have $900 in bills. You could just add a zero to those numbers if you live in New York. You have a, you know, you have a hundred dollars left. You give ten dollars maser. You can give it for this bit knesset. You can give it for talmid chacham. You can give it for kiruv. Give it for a righteous cause. Don't give it to just some any guy that's wearing a, uh, you know, a, a, a uniform without knowing him. Make sure your maser is an investment. Don't be a fool. You don't want to get, you don't want to be like this guy that I know, Hashem Elachem, it's actually a very, very close relative of mine. Starting to do tshuva, but you know, when you start to do tshuva, you still have your past life with you. He actually had a cart club. Very tough to leave that business. Especially when one day, he sees a so-called religious guy show up. Black and white, beard can sweep the floor like Rabbi Mizrahi says. He has a penthouse in Gehenno. Hopefully he does tshuva. I don't know how you can do tshuva for something like that. Chilul Hashem. Very, very difficult to do tshuva without suffering, serious suffering. So now, I have all this money, I have all these wonderful friends that enjoy my money. I have a nice hobby, I go to World Series of Poker, I play some games. In May of 2006, I have the best month of my career, I make 1.6 million dollars in the month. Printing money. Making money was last year. This year we're printing money. So I decide to go on vacation, I go to Vegas for a month, play some games have a good time, I still make about two, three hundred thousand dollars for the month at the, back at work when I barely work. Then when I come back home, kind of bored, so I figure, you know what, let me start taking care of my health. There's this thing that's bothering me for the last 10 years that two thirds out of all human beings actually have. It's called hemorrhoids. It bothers me once a year. Let's see, what's, what's the problem of removing it and never having it bother me ever again. So I go to the doctor and the doctor says, listen, 
It's a very simple surgery. You come, you have a surgery, it takes maybe an hour, two hours. You feel a little bit of discomfort, which in medical language means pain. For a couple of days, you go home, you relax, you go back to work on Monday. So I'll get a couple of days vacation from work, a little discomfort, not so bad. That's what I thought. On November 18th of 2006, I wake up out of the surgery with a different body. My body changed forever. Something happened during a surgery that changed my nervous system and everything from my neck all the way down to the bottom of my feet was in pain, but not pain like you have a headache. Pain like if you take a knife and you just start cutting somebody open over and over and over and over and over again. A little bit like that. Also electric shocks too. We don't know why. After several hours and the most amount of morphine legally allowed to give a human being, eventually I calmed down. They released me, they sent me home. I got home, I thought, oh, so that's what getting home looks like. Fine, I'm going to sleep. It's wonderful. Thank you very much everyone for coming. I'm going to sleep. I go to sleep and I wake up 45 minutes later. Only problem is that this time it's worse than the first time, and this time it does not stop. The screaming does not stop. Not after an hour, not after a day, not after a week, not after two weeks, not after five weeks, only after 62 days. For 62 days, the screaming did not stop. For more than 15 minutes, I couldn't sleep. My body started dying. I started bleeding from my eyes and every hole in my body. I got infections everywhere and no one could explain it. No one could explain the diagnosis. No one knew why I was screaming. And even later on when I tried to file an insurance claim because I had a disability policy, they rejected me. After six months of research saying it's impossible. If you want the money, you have to sue us. So after two months, 62 days of wonderful experience of gain home, I eventually start getting back to my life. I'm only taking 20 painkillers a day instead of 50 or 60. Start managing, able to walk to some extent. I go back to work, life is not the same, but I figured that I got a second chance. I still don't do tshuva. Nine months pass, because that's the amount of time that Hashem gave me to do tshuva. I don't answer. He gives me a pain in my leg. I think I pulled a muscle. The next day I'm in the emergency room, the intensive care unit doing a surgery that if I didn't come, at that time, and I would have waited even another hour to two, the infection that's inside my body would have blown up, gone into my blood system, and would have died within hours. So I spent the next two weeks in intensive care units next to the people that are nearly dying. Some are actually dying. Their screams sound familiar to mine. After a few weeks, I'm released from the hospital. I still don't do chuba. Three months later, as you've noticed, the time keeps getting shorter. This is one of the signs from Hashem, when He's running out of patience for you. The signs and the siyat dishmaya slowly disappears. To do tshuva is easy. The beginning is hard. To commit to Hashem is hard in the beginning. To test in the beginning. When you do tshuva, you have miracles on a daily basis. I'm not miracles. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not a prophet. I'm not anything. You do tshuva in your early 20s, you have siyat dishmaya that's unbelievable. You wait until your 70s, it's almost impossible for you to do tshuva. So now, three months later, my body continues to fail. A month later after that, another infection, another surgery, another intensive care unit, and this continues for the next seven years. For seven years, I had pain 24 hours a day. Got to a point where I got used to pain. So now when you're in pain, you can't really function and work. You can't be this ultimate salesman you used to be. The money you have means zero, because all I have in those days is many bottles just like this, like five, six of them, which is antibiotics and painkillers and all types of things. Baruch Hashem, I'm not taking them anymore. But just so you know, I had many, many of these. I have so many of them that I collection. I know the names, I know the doctors, I know the inventors. You become an expert. No, doc, this one doesn't work for me. He goes, how do you know? He says, I tried it 50 times. But the other thing I have, is something also very interesting that a lot of people like, is my nice gold business card. How much is it worth? Nothing. Why? Because when you're in pain, nothing's worth anything. I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on doctors, medicine. I become an experiment. I would go to over 50 different doctors just to find a diagnosis, not even a cure. I gave up on a cure. Now all this time, the same way the money came in, it starts running out. 
And those friends, remember those friends I was telling you about? They weren't my friends anymore. They became enemies. Start stealing from me. Start cheating me. Start stealing my customers. Start stealing stuff from my office. Take advantage of every single thing they can. Similar to an animal, I think it's called a vulture. So this continues for many, many years. Life becomes Gehenom. I want to end my life, but I only feel bad for two special women in my life. One of them being my wife and the other one being my mother, who wouldn't stop crying over me. And I knew that I would ruin their life if I died. But I got to a point where I couldn't walk. I had to use a cane. I became very antisocial. I would see my parents maybe once every few months. I wouldn't answer any phone calls. Business was going downhill. Problems were going uphill. All of a sudden, the government started taking interest in some articles that I wrote about them, calling them out for being cheaters and liars. Started auditing my firm, and if, even though they couldn't find anything, because Baruch Hashem, everything was kosher, I couldn't stop them from torturing me. And they pretty much parked in my office. After they finished one audit, they bring another audit. At one point, I think it was in 2009 or 2010, I had six simultaneous audits, which only firms like Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch would have. And even they wouldn't have six of them at the same time. I was a tiny little firm. I mean, we were making money, but relative to the real firms, nothing. When Hashem wants you to get back to earth, He has His ways. And one of the things that I didn't realize is that the same one that brought me into this world is the same one that's doing it. He didn't forget me. He doesn't hate me. He's trying to save me. But as Shlomo HaMelech says, The pride of man will be his downfall. My gava was my skill set, my ability, my money. Why should I worry about anything? Hashem gave me something to worry about. Now, Akadosh Baruch Hu is very interesting. You see, when He wants your attention, He'll get it no matter what you want. But sometimes He's a little bit upset at you because He tried getting your attention a few times. He sent you a message, He sent you a text message, He sent you a WhatsApp, He called you, He knocked on your door. He didn't get your attention, He never called back. So this time when He got your attention, He goes all out. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Am Yisrael, if you do good, I'll give you good. Im bechokotai telechu, He gives you 13 verses of blessing. But if you don't do good, 49 different curses we get. Hashem Yerachem. One of them is Aster Astir Panai. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm going to hide my face. When Hashem wants to hide His face, it doesn't look good. So when I was screaming my lungs out and the pain medicine didn't work, that was a small version of it. But then I went to the hospital because pretty much I was dying. And we went to the emergency room and you figure that the emergency room has good doctors. And in Manhattan, each one makes a zillion dollars. You figure that all of them know what they're doing. So I go to the doctors and I'm screaming and yelling in an emergency room. And uh, the doctor comes in, looks at me, and decides, Mamash, it didn't make any sense. They barely even talked to me. They just decided what they're going to do. Now, usually, they ask you 500 questions. Usually, they ask the family 550 questions. Usually, they look at you with, you know, very, very calm and, you know, just very careful. They don't want to hurt you even more. You're already in pain. No, here, it was like I was cattle. So, the doctor decided, okay, she sent somebody. Okay, you give him a catheter. Shem Yachem, anyone that knows, Mevin Yavin. Anyone that knows what that means, it's not much fun. Now, after they do that, the doctor says, calls another five big doctors, big uh, nurses. Each one of them, okay, hold them down. Five of them hold me down, and she decides that she's going to investigate the entire surgery, open the whole surgery, without giving me any type of anesthesia, without giving me any type of anesthetic, nothing and goes to the extent of putting the entire arm inside my body. Like I'm a puppet. Hey, Yaron, he is. Now, you guys probably heard the scream, you just didn't know it was me. The type of screams that I screamed that day, the type of pain that I felt that day, I remember like it was yesterday. It'll wake up the dead. That was another aspect of HaKadosh Baruch Hu hiding his face. When he makes the smart doctors really stupid, when he makes a human being act like an animal. This continued for some time. I went to other doctors. Each treatment would be worse than the other. After a couple of months of this adventure, eventually it's the pain started calming down. I would only have to take 20 to 25 painkillers per day just to survive, but still nonetheless it was better than the gain home for those two months. So body calmed down. I started going back to Wall Street. 
it would take me about 45 minutes or so to get to work, even though it was only about maybe a half a block away. So for example, to walk from here to the end of the room for a normal person would take, I don't know, maybe a half a minute, 30 seconds. For me, it would take somewhere in the neighborhood of a half hour to 40 minutes. I had a cane. I looked like I was 900 years old, even though I was still in my 20s, 26 years old. Some people thought that the cane was a fashion statement. So you started seeing other Wall Street guys with canes at that time. So anyway, so this happened. I had a, a very uh, difficult time walking, running, breathing, or even tolerating anything. But nonetheless, I had hope. I figured that things are getting better, will continue getting better. Well, they got better for a little while, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu thought that I was going to get the message that it's time for me to say Shema Yisrael. It's time for me to change my life. I didn't get the message. Oh Hashem, I figured, okay, the worst of it is behind. We saw Genom, we saw Kafakela. Next time we're going to see Gan Eden. Well, you have to go to keep Shabbat for Gan Eden. You have to keep kosher for Gan Eden. You have to learn Torah for Gan Eden. I didn't do any of those things. I just figured I have bad luck. So six months later, the other leg started hurting. I said, ah, oh, can't be. What's the chances? I mean, how bad could bad luck be? Even a broken clock is right twice a day. I mean, come on. I went to the doctor. He said, it doesn't look good, sir. You have to have a surgery. I said, when? He said, immediately. Okay, so we go back to the intensive care unit. They tell me my situation is worse than I thought. The other guy was just being nice about it. I have to have a surgery immediately. I'm in the hospital for another few weeks. But this time, since I didn't get the first message or the second message, they sent me some Mexican doctor where apparently in Mexico, there's a certain type of people over there that don't have feelings for other people. So he learned his medicine from the other people that I, I met in NYU. He also decided to check me without anesthesia, without any painkillers, without anything. And he decided he's going to really check. He opened the wound. He put his hands in. He started taking, oh, wow. It was a lot of fun. It was a, a blast, Rabotai. I mean, if you ever wanted to learn my shiur about Genom, this is a little worse. Why? Akadosh Baruch Hu said, if you don't do tshuva, you don't do what I say, I'm going to hide my face. Why? All the smart people become stupid. All of the things that make sense don't make sense. The world goes upside down. Why? I'm trying to get your attention. You didn't listen the easy way. You didn't listen to the shiur way. You didn't listen to the CD. You didn't listen to the WhatsApp message. You didn't listen to all the other things. So I got to get your attention in an unfortunately hard way. Life becomes hell. Literally. And now I get to a point where I have to go to the hospital every month and that's not even enough. So I start going to doctors on a regular basis. Every week I have at least two to three doctor's appointments. Every week we're trying a new doctor. We tried over 50 different specialists from everywhere of every type of trade, regular, holistic, traditional medicine, all types of things. I even got to a point we were so desperate, I joined the study. I became a part of an experiment. They started injecting my body four or five times a week with ozone just to see if something will happen to my body. Maybe I'll purify, maybe I'll die. Figure 50-50 chance. And I became a part of an experiment. And they started, you know, writing down, okay, so you didn't really act so well today. Wow, tough luck, kid. Uh, so this was our only hope. I started taking steroids like the athletes. But because I had a lot of money. So every shot, $1,500. Every day, a few times a day, maybe that will work. All I got is side effects. Started going to different types of doctors. They started saying, maybe it's a nervous problem. Maybe you have nerve issues. So they started giving me nervous medicine, all types of drugs that affect your brain. Well, after about a couple of hours of taking one of those drugs, I started thinking and contemplating, what would happen if I run into moving traffic? And I started contemplating suicide. And I didn't understand why do I want to commit suicide? I'm not happy, but I'm not depressed. And then I asked my wife, honey, can you look at that medicine? Does it say anything about side effects? She says, why? I said, I don't know. For some reason, I'm starting to contemplate vision, vivid imagination. My vivid imagination is starting to picture me running into moving traffic, me jumping off a building. And I don't know, I woke up this morning fine. Just after I met this doctor, he gave me this new medicine. I'm starting to commit, want to commit suicide. So she started going into a panic. She looked at it. She says, yes, that's the first side effect. I said, okay, so finish with that one. And we tried all types of medicine, but the medicine didn't work. This continued on for over seven years. 
Seven years, every dollar that I had was going out the window. The friends became enemies. The doctors became pretty much a uh, permanent part of my life. And little by little, I started realizing that I don't really want to live anymore. Now, Kadosh Baruch Hu, even though sometimes his message is harsh, sometimes his message is painful, at the end of the day, if he's still giving you a message, that means he loves you. Because if he didn't, there wouldn't be a message. There would just be a conclusion. So he gives you a test that you can handle, even though you don't agree. But at some point, you break. And at that breaking point, or right before that breaking point, that's where Kadosh Baruch Hu gets involved. I started praying. Didn't work. I said, ah, somebody recommended this Rav to go to Shield Torah. All these religious people that would come to my office had no recommendations whatsoever. They just hoped that I'd continue to give them money. Still didn't tell me there's anything wrong with my life. So I went to Shiur Torah every Tuesday. In the beginning, maximum, I would survive five minutes. Five minutes, fall asleep. Couldn't take it. It was very interesting. But there were so many sins on my soul. There's something called a klipa, a peel, a shell. It's around your soul every time you, you make a sin which makes it very, very difficult for you to learn Torah. You have a lot of sins and a lot of impurity, especially if it's wasting seed, especially if it's Chilul Shabbat, major sins. Develop a shell around your soul, so you can't learn Torah like you want to. I was a Talmud Chacham and everything else. You give me a company, I can tell you exactly how much it's worth. You give me a business, I'll tell you exactly how to fix it, how to grow it, how to market for it. In that world, I was better than anybody else I know. I'm sure somebody else better exists, I just didn't know that. Torah world, five minutes. Next week, five and a half minutes. Next week, capped out at six. So I started forcing myself to stay up. I said, you know what? I'm going to write down every single thing he says. If you keep moving, you have to stay up. So I started writing everything he says. This was Rabbi Pinto in, uh, in the city. It's very interesting, but I still didn't do chuba. Here and there, I started doing tefillin, giving some staka, whatever I had. Money was running out the door faster than I can count. But anybody that needed help and I had some money, I'd give it to them. Never really meant much to me as far as money. Just like making it. But eventually the health again started deteriorating again to the point where I wanted to commit suicide. I got to my limit. Obviously Hashem knew. And that's when the first miracle happened. My mom saw me in a really, really bad condition and your moms know exactly who you are without you saying a word. She knew that I don't have much time left, at least not psychologically. So she decided to take one of these books that she has, these phone books that she has. She collected the rabbi's names from all over the world with phone numbers and she starts calling every single rabbi in the book. For almost two hours, she's calling rabbis, but nobody's answering the phone today. Then she reaches a number in Israel. A woman answers the phone. She asks for a certain rabbi, and the woman says, I'm sorry, it's the wrong phone number. There's no such rabbi in Hebrew. My mom breaks down and starts crying to the strange lady over the phone. And then Hashem shows us himself. And the woman says, Dolis, which is my mother's name. She says, who is this? How do you know my name? She dialed the wrong phone number in, in a different country. And she got to not only a person that knows who she is, recognizes her voice, which is not very easy, by the way, especially since she just never talked to each other on the phone in their life, but is also the only person that can help. And she says, who is this? She goes, this is Penina, your niece. How did I get to you? I don't even have your phone number. We've never talked on the phone. She says, I don't know. But if you got to me, then obviously Hashem has a reason. Why are you crying? She tells her the story. My son is dying, I need some help, I need to speak to a rabbi. She says, why don't you uh, talk to my brother, Rabbi Ephraim? He's a big Talmud Chacham, although very young, he's extremely accomplished. He's written six books by the time he was in his early 20s. He's one of the Talmudim of Rabbi Vadya. He finished the Shas four times before he was 20. This is somebody special. This is one of these people that's not from this world. It's not from, he's the wrong generation. She says, will you talk to me? She goes, yeah, of course. You're uh, Doda Doris from America. You're uh, the Aunt Doris from America. Of course, I'm going to talk to you. So she calls Rabbi Ephraim. Rabbi Ephraim is in color, of course, like a Talmud Chacham that he is. And she starts crying to Rabbi Ephraim. Now, I did not know that Rabbi Ephraim exists because when I left Israel, he was still a child. He was born maybe a couple years before. He's younger than I am. I didn't know he existed. I didn't know anything about him. And he didn't really know much about me. So he asked my mom, does he speak Hebrew? And she says, yeah, he speaks a little. He speaks Hebrew. So, okay, so can I call him? Goes, no. He won't talk to you, he barely talks to us. He barely talks to his own family. And at that very moment, I called my mom for the first time in years. The real reason of why I called my mom is because I figured that if I'm gonna commit suicide, I should be nice to my mom for a little while. I got to my peak. 
called my mom. My mom is hysterical, crying. And she says, talk to him. I said, to who? She's hysterical. Talk to Ephraim. Who's Ephraim, Bechlad? What do you want me to talk about? Why are you crying with him? What does Ephraim do that you're crying because of him? No, I think you talk to him. He can help you. He can help you. I said, okay, anyone you want can just call me. Just stop crying. So uh, Ephraim calls me. I start asking him questions. Questions I had my whole life. And for the first time in my life, I get answers. But not just answers. I get answers with sources. And not only that, when I would ask a question, he'd make me feel good about it. I thought I was smart. This guy was an alien. So then I ask another question. He goes, oh, wow, that great question. It makes you feel so good. Like I'm like, yeah, of course I ask the same question. What do you mean? I'm from Wall Street. Of course I ask the same question as the Rambam. Little do I know that I'm closer to being a monkey than the Rambam. He goes, oh, yeah, this rabbi asked the same question 412 years ago. On this page, this paragraph, this panic, and I ask everything. So the first conversation was very nice. An hour and 40 minutes. The following week, he calls me Thursday, 4 o'clock. We have a conversation for three hours. Same thing, questions, answers, sources. Following week, Thursday, 4 o'clock, five-hour conversation. Following week, Thursday, 4 o'clock, seven-hour conversation. Straight, whole time to lock. But questions about everything. Business, money, dinosaurs, science, anything you can think of. I couldn't believe it. I was getting answers. It was like a high. Something like unbelievable. The pain all of a sudden was not relevant. I didn't care. I was in pain, not pain. It's getting answers. Finally, you're finally finding the reason for even being in this world. You're finally getting answers. Getting answers for anyone that hasn't gotten answers in their life, you have to try. As Hashem says to us in Sefer Dvarim, chapter 4 If you look for me, you'll find me. But only if you look for me with all of your heart and all of your soul. You can't look for Hashem like a cat. You look behind the garbage, oh, he's not here, we're gonna buy another one. It's not fish, you look in the aquarium, ah, he's not there, I think maybe he died. No, Hashem is the purpose of life. Hashem is everything. You have no Hashem, you have nothing. Kill yourself to find Hashem. You have no Hashem, you have nothing. I had millions, I had nothing. With the millions in the bank, but still having nothing. Still being depressed, still being miserable, every day. Reason why I worked so much is to escape the misery I actually lived. So now, finally I'm getting answers, and for the next nine months this continues. Average conversation is about seven hours. Five to seven hours, usually seven hours. I get into it so much, everything I learn I start to teach my wife. She loves it also, we're getting answers, we're asking questions. He later on tells me that he used to pray a special prayer before our conversations to have the answers. I said, what do you mean, have the answers? You knew the page number, you knew the Rob, you knew the year. He says, but before you asked the question, I didn't know the question existed. I never asked the question. I didn't ask the same questions you asked. I never cared about that stuff until you asked it. That's what's called Siyat Bishmaya. You want Siyat Bishmaya? You want help from heaven? You want a special deal with Hashem? Do Kiruv. Spend time, spend five minutes a day. Who gets more than 310 worlds? Who gets to a higher level than Malachi Asharet? Someone that spends time every day doing Kiruv. Hashem said here, if you bring forth an honorable person from a glut, then you will be like my mouth. What is it like to be like Hashem's mouth? Hashem says to Chazal, I created the heaven and the earth and I can revive the dead. You're the same as me. Your prayers, whether you're asking for a new job, a batzug, an honorable wife, an honorable husband, good children, full health, parnasa, refuah shlema, more siyat bishmai with your Torah, more siyat bishmai with your tshuva, that's just the beginning. What do you need to do? Five minutes a day. Start with five minutes a day, Kiru. So we go to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 15, verse 19. Lachen, ko amar Adonai, im tashuva ashivecha lefanai ta'amod, v'im totzi yakar mizolel, kepi tiye. Therefore thus said Hashem, if you repent, I will bring you back and let you stand before me. First part means your tshuva is always welcome. Even if you did idol worship, which is by the way, in case someone doesn't know, it's the same thing as Chilul Shabbat. In Hashem's eyes, another source of proof, notice every time Chilul Shabbat is mentioned in the Torah, idol worship right next to it. Ten Commandments, Chilul Shabbat, fourth commandment, next to it, idol worship. Why? To Hashem, it's the same thing. You can have desires, but doesn't mean you have to act upon them. Somebody has a desire to kill. There are certain people that have a desire for blood, but they have a choice. They can either become a murderer or a butcher or a surgeon. All three see blood and they're fine with it. It's your choice. I start doing tshuva, I start listening, I start keeping some mitzvot, I start praying, I start crying. I start realizing that I'm in a serious problem. 
What's my problem? Aside from the money being lost and running out of my life, aside from all of my friends becoming enemies, from all of this disaster that I'm living, I realized that my situation at home with the love of my life is not okay. The only woman that would have ever stayed with me through this disaster, that should have left years ago, was with me, was excited to be with me. I'm in pain, she's excited to be with me. Take care of me, make me food, clean my wounds, the blood, get in home that I was living with, treat me like I was a king, run my company, build my company, anything you want. Genius. She wasn't Jewish. When someone is Jewish, he's not allowed to be with a non-Jew. Now, I always knew that, but I couldn't justify this being wrong. When people would tell me, listen, don't you want her to convert and have Jewish kids? So if she wants to be Jewish, she'll be Jewish. I can't tell her to do something I'm not doing. I'm not a hypocrite. But then she says, yeah, but I can never convert. There's no such thing. I said, no, no, I heard people convert. She goes, no, I don't think it's, I don't think it exists. That's how little we knew. We didn't know that Rabbi Akiva, the greatest Baal Tshuva in history, came from converts. Some of the greatest people in all of history were converts. After I realized that we can't stay the same, we can't stay together, I couldn't bring myself to leave her. It's the only person that would tolerate me. So now I started learning about Christianity. Because you can't stop making someone believe something. So what do you have to do? If anyone's ever had a debate and you want to win, you have to know more information about their subject than they do. You have to know more about their side. Use proofs from their side, from their life. And you show them how they're wrong by using their own information. This is how the best lawyers in the world win arguments. This is how the best debaters win arguments. This is how politicians win arguments. This is how you win. You cannot win with your tools. You have to win with their tools. And then after you've gotten ahead, then you use your tools. I start becoming obsessive, not only with learning Torah, but also learning about this Abu Dazra they call Christianity. And I see that there's a lot of mistakes, there's a lot of contradictions, but I still think at this point that, yeah, it's just Judaism is better. Christianity is like second class. There's like mistakes in it, there's some guy that has some crazy story, and for some reason everyone draws him with long hair and a beard, he looks like a rock star. I don't know, whatever, they want to believe this crazy story, fine. So I start becoming obsessive, I listen to this Rabbi uh, Tobia Singer, genius, knows more about both the Torah, of course, and the New Testament than any Catholic, any Christian, any scholar. He knows it by heart, he knows every pasuk, it's amazing. I liked him, full of information. I bring this to my wife, excited. I'm, you know, it's like five o'clock in the morning. I'm as excited as I could get. I'm like a, you know, Einstein. And I bring her this thing and she shoots me down like a nothing. He speaks too fast for me, I'm not interested. I can't understand what he says and I have to look up the verses. He, he mentions 50 verses in two seconds. I can't read, I can't even hear or listen or write that fast, not interested. So, what do you do when you have no choice? You cry to Hashem. Hashem that you just met for the first time in your life. You start crying. You start reading Tehillim. You start praying with tears. You want your prayers answered? Start crying, man. It's no shame in crying to Hashem. Women, be a machmirim in crying. It's good to cry. To Hashem, best thing in the world. All of the gates of heaven have been closed. The only one that remains open is the gate for tears. I cry to Hashem. I learn His Torah. Work is becoming more and more meaningless to me. Money never really meant much in the first place. But as I continue to lose money, I start caring less and less. But I need to find an answer. I find other debates, other rabbis, other proofs. I even have Rabbi Fryan send me information. He even spent time learning this stuff just for me. He writes this whole journal, this whole letter of proofs against Christianity. I prepare this project for my wife and I'm like, here. Yeah. I'm so, so excited. Usually it was like four o'clock in the morning. And she's trying to sleep and I'm wired and I give her this thing or sometimes it's the first thing I give her when she wakes up. Instead of saying good morning, it's like, here, honey, I stayed up all night and I prepared this thing for you. She's leaving me alone. What do you want from my life? Let me drink coffee, wake up, right? something. I was, I give her this information. It's nice, but it's not enough. One day I go on the internet and there's a recommended video for me. It's called The Debate by Rav Mizrahi. I watched this on my own and for the first time I realized that I was wrong terribly about Christianity. It's not second best. It's completely fake. 
It's completely man-made, has zero truth in it, nothing. I get excited, I bring this to my wife, and I tell her, you gotta watch this debate, it's really good, it's this, it's that. She's fine, fine, it's three parts of this debate, it's like three and a half hours. She's all right, I'll watch one part. So we watch this part. At the end of part one, I'm as excited as can be. I'm like, wow, do you realize what it's done? Well, the Christian is a moron and the rabbi is arrogant. Not interested. But even though she's keeping mitzvot with me, she's keeping Shabbat with me, and she thinks there's problems with, she knows there's problems with Christianity. She always knew, even before me, the whole life. She created her own religion. After about a week of convincing and convincing and convincing, eventually I convinced her to watch part two. But still not enough. She thinks the rabbi is still arrogant and the Christian is still a moron. I'm running out of options. I try to convince her to watch part three, and until this day she hasn't watched it. But something changed in between. So I try to convince her and convince her and convince her, and our life is becoming hell. My pain continues, the money problems continue, the government issues continue, but one new additive that I never had a problem with, which is Shlom Bayit. We never had a fight, Baruch Hashem, until this happened. Now all of a sudden we're fighting every day. Not even about the religions, just about the fact that I'm being a little bit fanatic to convince her that there's something wrong with it, because now that I found out it's fake, I'm not thinking about saving me or this marriage. I'm thinking about saving her. For me, it's pikuach nefesh. It's like someone's in a fire and they don't know they're being burned. Someone's about to drink poison and you have to stop them. So eventually, enough tears, enough prayer, enough studying Torah, Baruch Hashem, and less and less work. Hashem has mercy and He sends me another video recommended. This one's called Torah and Science. Also by the same amazing, but until this point, was known as this arrogant rabbi. So then we watch part one of Torah and Science, there's three parts. At the end of part one, we're both amazed. Whatever belief in emunah that I had, went up 500%. Whatever belief in emunah she had, also went up 500%. We've never seen the world the way he proved it. Two o'clock in the morning, we press on part two. Satan, as I said, he works really hard. Part two doesn't work. You go to another source, find the video, part two. Part two doesn't work, can't find part two. Of course, if you go right now to part two, you'll see part two works everywhere. But that day, it didn't work anywhere. Apparently, a very big tzaddikah was coming to Am Yisrael. He couldn't let it happen. So skipping from part one to part three was a really big stretch for me. So it was really hard, my last tikkun. But I said, I finally got this girl to watch part one. She watched part two, it's not working. I said, it's not working. I can do it. Let's watch part three. We press part three and it works. We watch part three, it's amazing. And we now goes from 500%. Now we're closer to a thousand. Cause you're seeing Hashem. It's not about believing in Hashem. Believe anybody, any moron can believe there has to be a creator. You don't have to be a genius to believe there has to be a creator. Even if you love science and you think everything came from some cell and it went to four cells and four cells became eight cells and somehow it became a fish and a fish grew legs and became a lizard and a lizard somehow became so perfect he became a monkey and the monkey is here. Even if you believe in that, where did the first cell come from? Has to be a creator. Someone had to put the, the first cell in the world. You don't need to be a genius for that. But knowing God is what Hashem commands us. You need to know that I exist. Part three helped us know. Now she's telling me at the end of this lecture, we're both on a high. It's four, five o'clock in the morning now. You know, watching all popcorn, we're having a good time. We're discovering God. It's like the greatest thing in the world. She says, listen, uh, a lot of my questions have been answered, but I still need to know that it's allowed. I still need a sign from Hashem. And generally, you're not allowed to ask for Hashem for signs. Just for anybody knows, Hashem does not allow us to ask for signs. You're not supposed to even look for signs. Not allowed. We're above the mazal. The stars are the mazal. We're above the mazal. Our actions dictate Hashem's actions. Whatever your mazal is, your actions can change it. If Hashem says, listen, right now his mazal is to lose all of his money. You do certain things, you can change it. As a Jew, you have a privilege to the rest of the world. You are above the mazal. Know that forever. So now, neither one of us obviously knew this. I need some type of sign, but she gets to a point where if anyone that's never met a convert should know that one of the reasons why Hashem mentions the convert more than anything else in the entire Torah, but doesn't just mention them. He mentions the special privilege they have in the world. He says, Jewish nation, we're, he's our father. But for the converts, I'm their father and their mother because they have nothing. When they convert, their parents are not considered their parents anymore, spiritually. Physically, they're still considered their parents. Biologically, they're still considered their parents. They're still supposed to honor their parents as long as their parents are not 
anti-Semitic. So I am their father and their mother. And he puts an obligation on Am Yisrael to love the Ger. You have to love converts, not just respect them. You're not even allowed to pressure them. Special treatment. Can't be a Jewish salesman with a convert. Problem with converts, problem that they go through, is that in between leaving the lie and discovering the truth or accepting the truth, even after they've discovered it, they don't necessarily accept it right away, there's nothing. There's an empty spot in the middle where they have nothing. In this world, that's Gehenna. Because even if you believe a lie your whole life, you don't know it's a lie. So for you, it's true. Even if someone thought money is the cure for all diseases and all problems and everything in the world, despite the fact that it's a complete lie, as you've obviously seen from this story at this point so far, once you realize it's not, you have to replace it with something. So a lot of converts get to a very, very big mashber, a very big dilemma, a very big depression. And that's what my wife got to. And that night, she went to sleep and she prayed to Hashem, saying, either give me a sign or take me from this world. But Hashem doesn't give you a test that you can't handle. And the very next morning she wakes up, Tisha B'Av, bad mood, but I am on a high. It's like maybe seven o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning. She's in a bad mood. I completely ignore the bad mood. Why? I found part two that works. By the way, most of this time I'm not sleeping. I'm completely losing my mind, but I'm getting the answers finally, Baruch Hashem. In part two of Torah and Science, Rav Mizrahi shows something amazing. He shows something called Torah codes, which is hidden mathematical secrets in the Torah of all information that exists past, present, and future. We just need to know what we're looking for. Hashem is clearly telling us anything that's mentioned, every letter, every dot, every nikud, every sentence, everything is relevant for eternity. Everything that's written in the Torah is relevant to you. It's relevant to you, it's relevant to you, it's relevant to everyone. Hashem knew you're gonna exist when He wrote the Torah. So in this Torah, he also gave us a prophecy, he also gave us a promise that after we make many, many sins, he's going to send us to the four corners of the world. And here he says of Sefer Devarim, Deuteronomy, in chapter 4, verse 27, Hashem will scatter you amongst the people and you will be left few in number among the nations where Hashem will lead you. There you will serve gods, the handiwork of man, of wood and stone, which do not see and do not hear, and do not eat, and do not smell. After he scatters us, instead of doing tshuva like a normal person, we get worse. What do we do? We start doing idol worship, a specific type of idol worship. The god of wood and of stone. Wood, the cross is wood. Every Christian, Catholic, that's their sign. False god of wood. After that, the god of stone. Mecca, Islam. Why? You go to Mecca, their, their Jerusalem is Mecca. What's in Mecca? It's a big, giant square stone they all worship. They'll pray to it in that direction. Ishtabach Shimon Hashem is very perfect. Using Torah codes, which in essence means they're using mathematical equations to have skips between letters to, to find words hidden within the words, words within the paragraph. It has to be an equal mathematical skip between each of the letters because then you can clearly see it's by design. Now we have in this verse, we have a Torah code. First word of this verse in Hebrew is ve'efitz, which means Hashem will scatter. Ve'efitz, you find the letter He. You skip 50 letters, you get to the word etchem, letter chaf. Skip 50 letters, you get to the word yishmeun, letter mem. What does it spell? Mecca. As we said, it's Islam. Again, in the same sentence that talks about the God of wood and the God of stone, we found who the stone is. Interesting. Right after that, same word, Ve'efitz, also has a Yud. 50 letters, you go to the word Shama, Ketashim. Another 50 letters, you get to the same word as in the Mecca, you find the Vav, in Ishmeun, which is Imach Shimo Vizichro JC. You find his full name inside the very same verse that says, who the false god of uh, wood and stone is. It's the only place in the entire Torah that you find it, and it's in the very verse that describes them literally. Before I saw this video, I saw other codes that were very, very interesting. And to me, this was extremely impressive, and the other codes he mentioned from the Rambam and several others were very, very good. But to her, she converted on the spot. That was the sign, that was everything. 
That was Hal Sinai. That was the Exodus. That was everything. She took everything on instantly. Baruch Hashem, we continued studying. Shortly later, she converted, went to the Bet Din. We had a chuppah the same day just to make sure it's kosher. Same day she converted in the morning. A few hours later, chuppah, kiddushin. A couple days later, Israel. Covered hair, tzniyut, everything. Prayers every day, limut Torah, something. Now I know why the Satan was working so hard. And that's when the miracles began. Miracles continued to happen. My health continued to improve. As obviously you see me today, you don't see me twinching, you know, clenching my fists or yelling or screaming. 99% perfect. From time to time there's some pain, but it's gun edit next to what we had in the past. But I still, as I was doing tshuva, I still had to pay the bill for the past. When you earn money and you don't do the right thing by it, and you make it your life, Hashem has to show you that money is nothing. You can't be cheap with Hashem. Because in reality, He gives you 100%, and He says, I gave you 100%. What did you want? 50,000? I gave you 50,000. You wanted 100,000? I gave you 100,000. You wanted a million? I gave you a million. What did you want? I gave it to you or no? Give me 10,000 back. Give it to my people. Give it to the tzaddikim. Give it to the chachamim. Give it for Torah. Don't give it to the casino. No, Hashem, you know, I know you gave me the 100,000 last month, but this month is really tough. It's really tough. Okay, I'm upset. I say, you know what? Don't give me the 10%. I'll just take the 90 back. So you switch. You're left with the 10%. That's exactly what happened to me. Everything was lost. But each time it was lost, I continued to learn Torah. And just like I was obsessed about Torah, about finding the truth for myself and for my wife, I fell in love with Hashem. When I left New York just a couple of years ago, I still had a small part of my business, I had a small fund, still had a few hundred thousand dollars left of my own money. I lost 80% of whatever I had, I had maybe a million, million and a half the year before, I lost 80%, it was a bad year. Still had a couple hundred thousand dollars left. Now if you lose 20 million and it goes down to a million, it hurts. If it goes from a million to 200,000, it actually hurts more. Because 20 million to a million, you're still living technically the same life. You're still okay. You're still not necessarily begging for change. But you go from a million to 200,000, you have to change life. You have to change your life a little bit. And what happens if you lose the last couple of hundred thousand? It depends. Do you have a Muna? Do you believe in God? Net, 100% God exists. Can anyone raise their hand? And tell me, I 100% believe in God. He created the heaven and the earth, oversees and responsible for everything. And I have no doubt. It's a tough question sometimes, especially when you're going through hell. But this is what God wanted me to do. He wanted me to get to a point where I have to believe in Him. I can't tell you I'm a tzaddik or even a chacham or anything. But one thing I work on a little bit is emunah. And if you want to get emunah, you have to work on it every day. It's like a muscle. But how do you work on a muscle? By ripping it apart. Same thing with Emunah, same thing. But I'll give you a secret of how to get to Emunah and I'll tell you just the first step of all how I got to some Emunah. The biggest rabbi in history other than Moshe Rabbeinu was Rabbi Akiva. He had 24,000 students that the lowest among them, the lowest one, not the highest one, the lowest among them was able to revive the dead. Somebody died, he just prays for them, they come back to life. That was the lowest. The highest one was a person that when he would learn Torah, his name was Yonatan ben Uziel, when he would learn Torah, there would be a fire, a spiritual fire that would be created, that would reach the heavens, and if a bird flew over it, it would be burnt, like a korban, like a sacrifice. Just learning from a book, like us, not like us. <laughs> Meaning such level of Kedusha, that they were like, might as well be a different species. When we found out about all of these wonderful people, we realized, wow, this is not only a good thing, this is good news, uh, let's let's do something. Okay, let's learn. Let's. How do we convert? You have to learn Torah, you have to take on mitzvot, you have to take on everything. When we found out that this is true, my wife says, I want everything. I said, yeah, but, you know, everything is a lot. She said, everything. You, you know, you have to be modest, no problem, everything. I said, you know, you have to cover your hair with the mitvachat and everything, everything. I said, you know, you have to eat this and that. She goes, everything. I said, I'm not ready. She goes, I am. I said, but, 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 but I'm, 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 I'm not so sure. She goes, I am. She said, it's either fake or it's real. It's real, I'm going all the way. Meaning she forced me to do even more tshuva. So now we have to call the Bedin. We meet a few times, Baruch Hashem. Everything works out perfectly. 
And the Bet Din tells us that listen, since you're together, you cannot live together, is, uh, especially now, and uh, definitely not after you get uh, after she converts. So the minute she converts, either you get married or you live in different places. I said, why waste time? We're getting married the same day, we're married at the same time. I said, no problem. We'll have the chupa at the Bet Din, meaning she dips into the mikveh. We finish, she's a Jew, okay, now we do Chupa and Kiddushi. Now, so far, so good, right? Here's the problem. Every single time there's something big supposed to happen that's holy, the Yitzhara has to interfere. Why? He has to ruin it. He has to give you a test. Why? To see if you really want it. There's a Pasuk in the Torah that says, Hashem says, he sends tests to the people he loves. Why? He wants to know if you love him back. If Hashem gave you only good, 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 all the time, to love him is very simple. But if he gave you a test, a flat tire, you lost some money, got sick a little bit, and so on and so forth, but you still keep Shabbat, oh, that means you really love him. That means you're really connected to him. So even though my business was collapsing, I still had something left. My health wasn't exactly so good, but I was getting somewhat better. We got a phone call, okay, bed dean, wedding, same day on such and such date. I said, great. Two days before the bed dean meeting, I get another infection. Now these infections, they're not like small infections that you can say, you know what, I'll just deal with it. It doesn't work that way. It continues to grow until you either die or have a surgery, or whichever happens first. So I said, well, I'm not having a surgery because I'm having a surgery. We have to delay this conversion, this wedding, this thing. I'm not doing it. So we're just going to go to the conversion. I'm going to suck it up for two days with the pain and agony and let this thing grow like cancer. But I'm going to, as soon as we leave the bed, we're going to the hospital. By the time that we got to the bed team, the infection was the size of almost a melon. Meaning I couldn't walk, I couldn't think, I couldn't do anything, but I was as happy as can be. Hashem said, you passed the test. How do I know? He didn't talk to me. But as soon as she dipped into the mikveh, my pain stopped instantly. Now I didn't actually realize it stopped. I just realized that uh, something good happened just now. But as soon as she came out, she goes, okay, so we're going to the hospital? No, we have to get married. She goes, no, no, but you're, you're sick. You have an infection. And I goes, no, I'm not in pain. I'm not in pain. Let's have the wedding. And then later on, we'll figure it out. So we went to go change clothes. And I said, okay, I'm going to go to the bathroom to go change clothes. Because this has to be a necessary part of the story. And after I undressed, I discovered something. Hashem also performed the surgery while she was going to the mikveh because my whole body was full of blood. Only difference is it didn't hurt this time. Now, some people have a hard time believing it. I care less. I saw it, I was a witness, I was there. The point is, Rabotai, is that sometimes Hashem wants to give you a, a big test to such an extent that He forces you to either believe in a supernatural or abandon everything altogether. <laughs> we got married and we realized, okay, let's, uh, let's, we have to change everything. We did everything good. Let's continue, let's continue learning, let's continue doing. So we had to undo a lot of things. And we figured, you know what? We'll do Kiruv, we'll make a little bit of money from the business and we'll survive. After a little while of learning, my rabbi told me, okay, it's time to take the next step. I said, what step? I finished. No, I said, no, no, you just started. I said, what, what do you mean? He says, you have to share the knowledge. Hashem <coughs> gave you a gift. I said, what gift? He gave me a wife. He gave me both Hashem. Health now, I'm feeling better. He goes, no, no, he gave you a different gift. I said, what gift? He says, he gave you the ability to speak. People like to hear you talk. I said, okay, yeah, I use it for business. I make a bunch of money from it. He goes, no, no, it's not for business. He didn't give it to you for business. He just sent you to business to train. He sent you to business to go training, learn how to talk. Why? To go tell people how to do tshuva. I says, really, you're serious? I mean, how much money am I going to make? This is nothing. I says, what? It's a great job. I used to make $3,000 an hour and now you tell me I work for free. He says, perfect. I says, you're not really a very good businessman, but I'm fine. He goes, what do you mean? Well, we're saving for Allah Abba. I says, what about Allah Abba? He said, Hashem runs the world. So I started giving Shuet to Allah. But I told him initially, I don't really know much. He says, whatever you know, teach it. You know Pasha Shavuot, Pasha Shavuot. You know Aser and Alakha, teach that one Alakha. And so on and so forth. And little by little, I started sharing my story. And little by little, I realized that most people know less than I do. But I got bored of my own knowledge, so I started learning more and more. It forced me to learn more. And it started working. People started doing tshuva. Regular people, regular average Jews were listening to the Shuet Torah on the internet. I never, I could never believe that somebody would listen to me. Like, I was a goy a few weeks ago, now you're listening to me. I couldn't believe it. Then rabbis started calling me, like, wow, you helped me do tshuva. I said, what do you mean, you're a rabbi? He goes, yeah, but I need to do tshuva for something that you said. And it was unbelievable to me that what I said affected different people from all levels. Rabbis, Talmidim, all types of people, even goyim, started converting because of it. It was unbelievable. 
Now, as you become more and more popular, there's more demand for you. The problem is that when you do business, you can't stop doing business. You have to continue making parnasa. You can't just say, listen, I'm going to stop working for a few weeks, then I'm going to come back. So I had to work for a part of my day and I had to learn for the rest of it. Now, to make sure that I stand the test and I do what I'm supposed to, my rabbi said that not only are you supposed to do kiru, but you're supposed to make sure that you eliminate any yetzara that you have. My biggest yetzara is success for money because that's how I measure the score. You know, it's not that you like money, it's not that I even need so much, especially when you change your life. I'm not buying any planes or anything. You just want to have food and make sure that your kids can eat. But the reality is that when you're in a business world, you're used to success. You continue making more, not because you need more, but it's a way to keep score. It's like, oh, I'm doing good because I made more money this month. I'm doing not so good because I made less money this month. That's, that's usually how businessmen do. They keep score based on their success. So I know my own test, and my rabbi also knows my own test. He says, listen, there's a big Yetzirah in the world. There's a big Avodah Zarah in the world. He says, what kind of problem? This is a big problem. What kind of problem is it? He says, Hashem gave a nevoah, gave a prophecy of what's going to happen right before Mashiach comes. I said, what is it? He says, that Am Yisrael is going to go worship the God of money, the God of gold. I said, you mean money? He said, exactly. He says, so anytime that money becomes involved, people's perspective changes. If I'm going to pay for it, then I'm going to dictate what he's going to say, because now he's my employee. If he's not getting money out of it, then what is he, what is he getting out of it? So we decided to do what we've been doing for the last four and a half years, which every lecture, wherever we go, we don't charge. Everyone at the shiul comes up with a single conclusion. There is no reason, there is no benefit for me to tell you anything that I just said for the last however much time it's been, other than you getting closer to Hashem. It's the only way to measure the score now, since it's not money, is success. What success? Jews doing tshuva. The next station is Financial Center. וירא ישראל את היד הגדולה אשר עשה אדוני במצרים ויראו העם את אדוני ויאמינו באדוני ובמשה עבדו after we left Egypt, Hashem destroyed the largest civilization in existence and made their slaves into the masters. So much so that the Egyptians begged Am Yisrael to leave. And not only did they beg him to leave, they gave him a bunch of gold, silver, diamonds, a huge fortune. Still, Am Yisrael did not have a Munah. How do I know? Because as soon as they got to Yam Suf, to the Sea of Reeds, they got scared. Huge ocean. Where are you going to go? All of a sudden, they noticed the Egyptians. They're coming to get them. This is a problem. Why? Because they didn't send five Egyptians, like people think. Chazal says that they sent nine million Egyptians. That's the smallest number. Some say much more. Big army, lots of weapons, very, very scary. <laughs> After Hashem split the ocean for them, He didn't just split it right away. When Moshe tried to split the ocean, initially, the Malach, the angel of the ocean, said no. I'm not splitting the ocean for you. Why? He goes to God. Not only him, he brings the Malach of Mitzrayim, which the name of that Malach is Mitzrayim. Each nation has an angel. So the angel that's responsible for the Egyptians, they come to Hashem and say, why? Why are you going to split the ocean for these Bnei Israel and kill the Egyptians? Okay, the Egyptians worship idols. We know Bnei Israel also worship idols. Just last week they're worshiping an idol. Ele of Dima Ele of Dima this is why, when Hashem did not split the ocean, Moshe started screaming to him. He says, Mati tzak elai, what are you screaming to me? Move on, move forward. What does it mean, move forward? He says, do something. You've used up all of your credits. I can't split the ocean for you. Because the Mekatreg, the angel of Egypt, he has a case against you. Show me you believe. Don't tell me you believe. Don't kiss the mezuzah on the way out of the Beknesset and go to a barbecue on Shabbat. Don't kiss the Sefer Torah on Shabbat, get excited and eat non-kosher on Sunday. Don't give tzedakah to the Beknesset or to Kiruv or to anything with stolen money. Whether it's from your gambling or from your stealing in the business, he doesn't want your stolen money. He wants kosher money. 
Show me you believe. You need actions. A part of Am Yisrael was willing to die. Jump into the ocean, just die. Commit suicide. A part of Am Yisrael says, let's just go back to being slaves. And a part of Am Yisrael says, let's go fight. But the one that was willing to die, not just willing to die, said, listen, if Hashem brought us here, He brought us here. But there was one specific person. He didn't want, he didn't think that he was going to die. He actually believed in God. His name was Nachshon ben Aminadav. Nachshon, the son of Aminadav, from the tribe of Judah. And Nachshon said, Hashem created the heaven and the earth. This is nothing for him. Hashem brought down the largest nation in history. This is nothing for him. Hashem brought us all the way here and made all of those miracles for us. This is nothing for him. If he brought us here and he says, move forward, I'm going to trust him. And he takes the steps into Yam Suf all the way to the point of when it covers his nose. Meaning he was willing to die to prove he believes in Hashem. And at the moment it reaches his nose, that's when the ocean split. Hashem says, you have to show me you believe. But why did I read you the verse of after this Kriyat Yam Suf, where it says, Hashem, let all the Jews, all the Am Yisrael cross safely in miraculous ways, drown the Egyptians. Then it says this verse, Parashat Beshalach, in Exodus or Shmot chapter 14, verse 31, Israel saw the great hand that Hashem inflicted upon Egypt and the people revered Hashem and they had faith in Hashem and in Moses his servant. In your prayer every day you read this verse. So Hashem said, Nachshon ben Aminadav showed you Emuna, showed you that he has it already. The people of today, we need instructions. How do I get to Emuna? How do I get to trust Hashem? 100%. First it says, Vayar Israel Israel, the nation of Israel, saw the hand that Hashem inflicted on Egypt. Israel saw. What is Israel saw? They paid attention. Pay attention to the world around you. You can't miss God. Can't miss Him. You look at this table, you know somebody made it, right? The Bikne said, some builder put it together. The city, somebody or somebody's put it together. What about the sky? Obviously, a creator had to put it together. Pay attention to the world around you. Look into the mirror. Look into your own eye. Notice that your eye is the best camera that was ever invented. Notice that the brain of the biggest fool in history is still more advanced than all of the technology that ever existed from the beginning of the world until the end of the world. If you learn a little bit about scientific facts, you can see Hashem. So first, pay attention. That's what he says. Step two. As soon as we pay attention, we realize there's a God. And this God is holy. This God is great. This God is in charge of everything, including the cells that are in your body, including something called protein fold. Your body is full of trillions and trillions of proteins. In order for you to exist, each one of these proteins has to fold in a precise way. If one protein, one out of trillions and trillions and trillions of them, folds the wrong way, the person can't see, can't hear, Shem Yachem, die, one protein. He's in charge of that too. So if you're, obviously if you believe in this great God and he's even in charge of these small proteins that you depend on, only somebody crazy or ignorant is not gonna be scared of God. He's in charge of everything. Vayiru, Yirat Shemaim, foundation of Judaism. Without Yirat Shemaim, you have nothing. Chazal says, a connection to Hashem only based on Yirat is an incomplete connection. It's a connection, nonetheless, but it's incomplete. Why? Because it's good to have Yira and Ava, both fear and love. But a connection with just love, just Ava, Chazal says there's no connection at all. It's worth zero. When you have just a little bit of time to spend, to pay attention to the Creator, you're gonna fear Him. When you fear Him, you can actually say you have Emunah. When you have Emunah, you're gonna start doing what the Oral Torah says, which means that you have to study Torah. And where I got to, Baruch Hashem, after losing all of that money about two years ago, I had only a couple of hundred thousand dollars left. And I already started doing lectures. On the Tuesday, that was my shiur kavua, my last, my shiur of the week. I did one shiur a week at the time. I still had the business. One of our investments went terribly wrong. I wake up in the morning, I get the news, not good news. 9.30 in the morning, the market opens. By 9.35, I'm wiped out. I have zero. 
nothing. What do you think I say at this point? For, losing the first few million, it's tough. Using the last million, it's tough. Last couple of hundred thousand, either is toughest and you're going to commit suicide or something else. The power of Torah is stronger than everything else, especially when it has to do with Kiruv. Hashem gave me the schut to say the same verse that Job said after Hashem took everything from him. Hashem Natan, Hashem Lakach, Yishem Hashem Evorach. God gave, God took, may His name be blessed. I shut off the computer and I went to prepare for my shiur for the night. And ever since then, I've been living on a miracle every single month. I haven't worked since. That's it. This is what Emunah is. I realized that there was a lot of people that were confused, just like me. And they simply created a new truth. Because I had two to three rabbis come to my office every week. And every single one of them got money every week, like clockwork. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but every single time, they got money. I had my office for 15 years, 16 years. So if you do the math, let's just make it simple. Once a week, for 10 years. How many times is that? 520. That means that they had 520 opportunities to tell me to stop driving on Shabbat and become a Jew. That means they had 520 opportunities to tell me that I have to marry a Jew and not a non-Jew. They had 520 opportunities to tell me that there are rules to the game. There are rules to being a Jew. You can't just do whatever you want. 520 opportunities. But no, they didn't take even a single opportunity. They were too focused on the green, too focused on the money. This hurt me personally because since they didn't tell me, Hashem had to tell me. And when Hashem tells you something, it hurts. It's not a nice lecture. It's not a smile. He tells you with life things, things that happen, sickness, money loss, kaparat avonot we call it, the, 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 the things that are, you know, that we, we lose because of the avonot, because of the sins that you made. So it's better off that a person listens to somebody like me than Hashem getting involved because to me, it may be annoying, it may be not something that you want to hear, but it's relatively painless. Hashem, I promise you, it's not painless. It's not painless. And I had to learn it through my much. I had to fight for my life. This happens every single day. So I decided that it's much more important to go make more Jews than to go make more money. It's much more important to make more Jews, real Jews, than to go make more businessmen. And we help businessmen, and we help families, and we help going that want to become Jews. We help all types of people. But the key is to focus on the emit. And Baruch Hashem, Hashem provides. Hashem provides. It's definitely not the millions or even a fraction of it. But I can tell you one thing for sure. The best thing that ever happened to me was losing every single penny that I ever had. And even better is the fact that I see miracles every single month because now we have more bracha than we had when we were making $5 million a year. Why? Right now, Baruch Hashem. I don't, I don't, nothing's missing. Nothing's missing. I'm, I'm not. I don't, have, I don't own a house. I don't own anything. You look at my bank, you start laughing. But I probably have more comfort than most people in the world. Why? I don't, have to have, I don't have to worry about money ever again. Why? I know Hashem runs the world. I arrived at a conclusion that Hashem runs the world. I'm going to go do what He wants me to do. The rest of it is His problems. My wife one, tells me one time, uh, Honey, uh, we have $6,000 in bills uh, coming up in two days. I said, Okay. She goes, What do you want me to do? I don't look at the bank. <laughs> She goes, well, I looked at the bank. I said, okay, no, no, what happened? She goes, well, it's empty. It's empty, there's nothing, zero in the bank. I said, okay. She goes, well, what do we do? Nothing. We continue doing what we're supposed to do. Continue working, continue learning, continue doing what we're supposed to do. Yeah, but the bills are doing two days. I said, yes, plenty of time for Hashem. It's his problem, it's not my problem. It's not my problem. As soon as we finished this conversation, we're both laughing, we're both smiling, went back to learning, went back to doing. I get a phone call for my uh, phone number. I don't know, and I usually don't pick up. I decide to pick this one up. I pick up. Hey, Yaron, how are you? I'm really sorry. I'm sorry, what did you do? Who is this? What? what, what? No, it's Dudu, it's Dudu. Dudu, Dudu, I'm thinking, who's Dudu? I know, Bechal, Dudu, Bechal. It's like, no, Dudu, remember, David from this. I'm like, oh, Manishma, David, how are you? Dudu, okay, whatever. Manishma, I haven't talked to this guy in six years. I'm like, how are you doing? 
He goes, listen, I'm really sorry. I said, sorry for what? I'm like, wow, what did you do? I, I haven't talked to you in five, six, seven years. He goes, no, five years ago, you lent me $5,000. And I told you I was gonna pay you back as soon as I come back from Israel. And uh, I never paid you back. And I've been eating myself up for months, thinking, how do I get there? And the, the embarrassment that I haven't paid him in so long, so I can't take it anymore. Please, text me your bank account. I'm going to deposit the money right now. So <laughs> This guy's excited to pay me my money back that I forgot about. Who has ever called you out of nowhere and says he's excited to pay you back? So I text him the phone number. A few minutes, uh, maybe a half hour later, my bank, I, uh, I check my bank. I see, dude, deposit 6000 I call back, dude, I'm like, no, dude, thank you very much, but I'm sorry, you not allowed. 5000 He goes, no, no, no. 6,000. I said, no, it's not allowed. It's interest. It's Hashem uh, Rechem. I go, no, it's not worth it. He goes, no, no, no. Listen to me. The 5,000 is the loan. The 1,000 is for Zikoy Rabin, for the Torah that you're doing. Because I've been watching you on the internet. I've been watching you on the internet and you're helping me do Shuba. Meaning, how much did I need? 6,000. How much arrived? 6,000. Is that, what do you think is better? You working for it from 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night and get 6,000? Or me doing absolutely nothing? My rabbi tells me, listen, I think you need to start learning Gemara. I said, Gemara? I don't know anything. He says, learn Gemara. I said, okay. And you know, so he got me a Gemara. It would take me six and a half hours, six and a half hours for one daf, for one page in the Gemara. And by the time I finished the page, I still don't know 90% of what I said. 90% of what happened. But six and a half hours, that's how hard it was for me. One day, when things were really bad, there was a hurricane here. We were in Manhattan, and Manhattan went underwater. So after four days of being in my apartment, with no water, no electricity, they told us that we have to evacuate. So we left Manhattan, we went to Staten Island where my parents are, and my business was going to garbage. My friends no longer existed. My health was in a toilet. The only thing I had going for me was on the fine. I started learning with them, I started liking what I was learning, but I was as upset as you can possibly be. And I just broke down. Just started breaking down because my whole life was just collapsing. My mom at that moment told me she had a dream. In my dream, I saw you. You were just like you, but you were a little boy version of you. But you were surrounded by a bunch of beasts, by a bunch of mazikim, by a bunch of creatures that were trying to kill you. And I kept telling you, come with me. Let's go to the light. Come. And I start crying to her. I said, Ima, I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. I just can't do it. And she would start screaming and she's crying in the dream and I'm crying in a dream and I'm surrounded by these things and they want to kill me and I can't leave. And she's not letting go and she wants me to come. Eventually I hold her hand and Baruch Hashem she says that the dream ended up good where well, we ended up going to this light. Now when I first heard this dream it didn't mean anything to me. Once I started learning Gemara, once I started learning interesting things in the Torah, I realized that every single time that a person sins, it's not just a sin that's for naught. It's not the sin that just goes away. It's not a cold, it's not gas, it's not breath. A sin creates something. That something is something that doesn't go away. It's called a mazik. It's called something that you definitely don't want in your life. If you make certain sins, they make one type of mazik. If you make many sins, you make many of them. But there are specific sins like wasting seed, for example, that create millions of them. Now, why do you have to care about this? The reason why is because this is one of the reasons why people have a hard time doing tshuva. It's not that you're stupid. It's not that you don't understand. It's not that you're incapable. It's not that you weren't brought up religious. It has nothing to do with it. It only has to do with the sins that you have. Once you start doing tshuva for them, that tshuva, those mitzvot that you do will start destroying those mazikim. And all of a sudden, you're gonna start understanding what you read. All of a sudden, you're gonna start remembering what you read. All of a sudden, you're gonna wanna do what you're doing. All of a sudden, you're gonna fall in love with a Kadosh Baruch Hu.
all of a sudden you want to be a Jew, you want to put a keep on, you want to put a, uh, everything on. You want to be Mordechai Yehudi with payers all the way to the ground. Why? Because you got rid of the enemies. So for all of the people that are having a hard time with the books, with the classes, with the CDs, with everything, my only suggestion is this. Continue. Don't let go. You just got to go through the hurdle. You got to go through the hurdle, the tough part. You got to make Torah a permanent part of your day-to-day -day life. 15 minutes a day is how I started. Eventually got more. Then it's 30 minutes. Then it's a half hour. Then it's an hour. And so on and so forth. One day a woman calls us and she tells us that she wants to abort her baby. I said, please come to my house. We'll talk to you. Aborting a baby is not allowed in Judaism. Okay, I'm thinking that I'm going to convince her with Torah laws and Torah codes and Torah this and Torah that. The woman's not buying it. My wife, God bless her, that she understands people better than I do sometimes. She says to the woman, see this. You're a Jew, we're Jews. You believe in Hashem, we believe in Hashem. Unfortunately, your struggle is that you think that Hashem gave you this mitzvah to have a baby, but he's going to starve the baby. So let's do this. We'll pay for the baby. Have the baby, and if you're missing any money, we'll pay for the baby. I'm looking at my wife, I said, thinking that you, we declared bankruptcy last month. We have zero money. Where are you going to pay for this baby? I'm thinking, I'm not saying a word, but I'm thinking to myself, I'm looking at my wife, and then I raise, wait, there's something called bitachon. There's something called confidence in a kalosh baruchu. And this is how we've been living our life. Trying to help different people for different things without any rhyme or reason of why other than a kadosh baruch Hu wants it done. A kadosh baruch Hu is giving everyone an opportunity. Every keila. You're in Nigeria, you're in Afghanistan, you're in Saudi Arabia, you're in India, you're in China, you're in anywhere. You want to do tshuva, a kadosh baruch Hu is going to get to you. First, you start with learning. Second, you stop sinning the big sins. Third, don't give up. Don't give up on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Don't give up on yourself.
you don't know, you don't understand. And that makes him an incredibly compelling speaker. All right, and, I, and it was my great, I could say more and more, but she was small little the fun of small little fun of It's my great uh, pleasure to be so, the speaker of Rabbi Yaron, Rabbi David.